<laughs> Marlene, fantastic to finally virtually meet you and invite you in a conversation about insects and art and design. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marlene. It's so nice to see you. <laughs> Likewise. I wanted to start out with a question about your history. Growing up in a family of beekeepers, do you feel it was only a matter of time before you started working with insect products in your art? Um, yeah, I think it's something that was really inside of me since I, I'm a kid, you know, I was uh, in the arts, in nature, with my family. So my grandparents were farmers, my old grandparents as well. And then my parents were beekeepers, so it was just mean to be like since the beginning, I was traveling with a beehive with my parents during summer. So we were living in a small caravan, like collecting honey, talking to the bees. Um, so it was very like natural since I'm super young. Yeah. <laughs> the way you describe it reminds me of this children's book called The Bee Man of Orn, where he travels with his uh, his pack of bees, his hive of bees, even a pocket full of bees and occasionally eats honey. I keep bees yeah. myself, although only a few hives. And there's something wonderful about being able to go in your backyard and be in the midst of tens of thousands of fellow animals going about their business in beautiful ways. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about how that might have influenced you in terms of your directions and maybe your entomophilia, your love of insects. You, you mean as a, as a kid? And growing up to today. Growing up. Um, I think I, I got a very profound love for bees like since a young age. But then I got a bit scared. I think, you know, around teenagers, I was like, oh, this is maybe not so cool anymore. And it's really when I started to look at their materiality during um, the Master of Research at Central St. Martins, uh, that everything came back to me. It was a very beautiful moment where everything fused kind of together. And um, it was a bit of a whisper, whisper of the bees, you know, like they were kind of calling me to um, to kind of give them a voice, you know, in my practice. So uh, I, I remember this time, it, it was around 10 years ago, 11 years ago now. So it's a bit uh, of a moment. Um, but it was yeah, a magical moment where everything came back together, you know. You, you, you know, you're created as a kid, when you grow up, you maybe you change direction. And suddenly everything is like puzzling in and uh, it makes what, uh, who you are and what you uh, make. So it was a very yeah, wow, magical so time. Almost like you came full circle realizing that they were worth embracing. Huh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, uh, people like to categorize and people like to categorize your work as art, mm, I love, design I love and when forced to, uh, how do you feel comfortable defining your work as design, as art? Mm. Uh, I think the best description would be no description. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I, okay. I like to say that some people call me an artist, other designer, and other weirdo. <laughs> and I really like <laughs> They go hand in hand, right? <laughs> I really like yeah like to keep it as open as possible because it allows you to collaborate with many people from craftsmen to farmers to scientists um so yeah of course you have to define yourself sometimes like when i i lived in london before and when i moved to france i had to choose who i was you know because mm -hmm. for the um, statute of your business you have to say are you an artist or are you a designer and it was very uh, difficult question mm -hmm. uh, so i decided to be or kind of tax reason, or I don't know, like an artist, but I'm a mix of a lot of things. And I love that. I think it's very important now to be pluridisciplinary and to touch a lot of different areas. And yeah, to keep your practice um, as open as possible. So maybe no description. <laughs> That's interesting. So you find it more valuable to be in the in-between, basically, as you say, the intersection mm. of the two, uh, instead of pigeonholing yeah. yourself as an artist or as a designer. 
Uh, yeah, I don't see why it would be important to put a label on on what I do. Like, I think it's a, like what I do is very sensitive and it's very emotional and there is connection with other species. So I think it's super important just to let the world go, you know, where it needs to go and it can go anywhere. It can go to the forest, it can go to a museum and um, and so many other places. And I think it's the magic of it just to let it as open as possible. Too many people as well, you know, I don't like this um, art thing when it got very complex and when nobody understands what you're talking about. I like to be accessible to like a kid, a five-year-old kid, to a butcher who doesn't know maybe some like art or anybody, you know, I think it's very important, especially in this um, kind of project where you have ecological um, questions uh, that, that raised uh, when, when you walk around this kind of subject to really let it open and understandable like to a lot of um, to the audience in general similarly i think scientists are finding it more and more important to be accessible with our messages so for example with issues that affect us all global climate change um habitat yeah. destruction biodiversity loss if we have pedantic abstruse hard to reach and hard to understand products, it doesn't make our message uh, as viable, accessible, effective. Yeah, yeah. and I think uh, it's where it's like the designer or the artist can come in, you know, it's like, I remember the first day I went to a laboratory, like with a lot of scientists, like I was like, oh my God, this is a very different language. Okay, I need a bit of translation sometimes. Yeah. Um, and it's nice for the artist to come in and to, uh, to facilitate this dialogue, you know, like to create a kind of bridge um, between languages and to articulate and to to facilitate the communication of those difficult topics. Because at, at the end of the day, they are really uh, heavy subjects, you know, to talk about. I would love to talk about collaborations of yours, for example, with King's College in London, and and to think in terms yeah. of this mutually beneficial exchange where oftentimes the my my understanding is that the intersection of science and art typically really benefits the artist being exposed to the science and being able to incorporate that in their work and oftentimes the other direction is dismissed or ignored or downplayed or more difficult to assess like how the artist essentially contributes to, gives back to the scientist. And mm, it's, more yeah. it's more complicated to think about how the art and the artists can inspire or contribute to the science itself. Um, mm. And we could talk about that, but certainly I'd like to talk about how your art contributes to the outreach, the communication, the accessibility, and the beautification of or um, making people realize how beautiful science the science can be I, I think there is two kind of uh, direction in your questions yeah. so the first one the, the I think what an artist can bring to a scientist for example yeah. um, I think we are we always start I mean in my practice I would say not every artist but me for example in my process I always start by kind of crazy ideas, you know, that are really maybe not feasible or whatever, but there is no limits, you know? <laughs> Good place so, to start. <laughs> yeah. So you go to a scientist, for example, you say, okay, I want to do this. And what do you think? Like, and they are like, oh, wow, who is this person? <laughs> it's a bit mad and like, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. So I think um, as an artist, you can bring um, um, an openness to, to different dialogues um, with the species in, in general or with uh, like science uh, reasons, but you can really um, open the minds to other territories. Mm. So you can open doors, I think, to things that are maybe a bit abstract because we are specialists to be abstract maybe in our ideas at first, but mm. I think it's, um, it's we, we can really open yeah, the minds of the scientists uh, and change maybe a little bit their way of seeing things, you know. Uh, I, I won't say that scientists are like this and artists are like this, <laughs> but 
but I think it's a question of language, like um, and opening up um, territories that are maybe considered uh, blocked for scientists. I don't know if it's clear what I said. But... I love that because uh, sometimes in science we can tackle the next step in a small way, but paradigm mm -hmm. shifts and huge um, transitions in science, scientific revolutions, oftentimes require mm -hmm. reaching out across disciplines or maybe yeah. having the science shaken up a little bit. So that totally makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> And in terms and for of, other, uh, please. yeah, for the other questions you mentioned, um, uh, it was about uh, how my work can uh, actually uh, talk to a large audience, right? Like to yeah, yeah. Um, so at first, I was really working into more like collectible design and art, so you know, like adding galleries and things like that. Uh, I did that for several years and then I was like, oh, this is actually not the place where I belong or where my work belongs. Mm -hmm. um, I really want to give like more a voice to insects in like public space, uh, in jungles uh, or, or in museums as well. But like, you know, to be able to reach like uh, museums that are open to a public, like with no fee that everybody mm -hmm. can afford to go. So it was very important to take this kind of um, other direction and to choose to let the work be like in nature, accessible to anyone in parks or yeah, like the la last project uh, we've done is in the jungle in Mexico. Of course, not a lot of people will go to Mexico uh, to see it, but it's just there and accessible for people to go and uh, and as well other species to, to go and to discover it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Could you, I would love to hear uh, between say collaboration, King's College London to Mexico, what these types yeah. of collaborations have been like and what is, so what is it like to work <laughs> with Marlene Huisu? Ah, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> that's good. Uh, so the um, collaboration uh, with King's College was in 2019. It was for the London Design Festival and it was a project um, uh, with Jane Witter Studio, who is like a very nice research studio um, based in, in London, um, around a lot of um, fame around ecological crisis and things like that. So they invited me and they put me in touch with two scientists from King's College um, to develop the first kind of habitat we made for the insects uh, in the cities. So it was a, a chair for insects, for example, um everybody was asking me to make a chair for human and my answer was to make a chair for insects <laughs> so i would say maybe working with me is a bit provocative sometimes <laughs> but i like that but in a in a nice way um and uh, so we were in dialogue with a person from a king's college back and forth so i was more asking them a lot of questions about what the pollinators really needed uh, to make the work actually really livable for insects um, so that was a very nice collaboration. And the other project is the, um, the one with the Spheric Museum in Mexico. Um, so this was a collaboration between a bee lover, uh, a helio, and uh, a lot of uh, craftsmen from the museum. And of course, the Meliponas uh, bees. Yeah. Um, that, that was an amazing project. Uh, so and it was interesting because this is, was a project from far away. So, um, you know, it was a bit of COVID time. So we, we discussed a lot through Zoom like today. Uh, and it's funny to see how it's it's possible to meet other species as well on Zoom. Oh. <laughs> uh, but then I went to where <laughs> then I went there to meet them in person as well, uh, the Meliponas. Oh. Um, so that was more uh, like a beekeeper, I mean, I don't say beekeeper because he's not really a beekeeper, he's more a bee lover, you know, he's taking mm -hmm. care of a bee, like a very sacred um, space within the jungle. Um, so it was a lot of communication with the bees, with the bee lover, with the craftsman as well to realize the piece. Um, I, I think it's quite smooth to work with me <laughs> in general. Um, I, I put a lot of optimism and energy in, in what I do. 
because it's very important. And at the end of the day, it's not really for me, you know. We created this four meter tall installation that was for many, very many ponas. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm just giving a lot of uh, love, I would say, <laughs> and care. And I think that's the really special, beautiful part one special and beautiful part of your more recent work, this idea that you're creating for the insects, not for the humans. And it's, yeah. it's fascinating to explore, uh, say, design trade-offs. What materials can you use? How does that limit the culmination mm -hmm. of the piece? And yeah. where do you draw the line in terms of aesthetic choices? So, for example, mm. uh, when, when you think about um, Please Stand By and you've got these yep. uh, gorgeous structures, were your initial thoughts, say, to have certain forms, colors, and were those mm -hmm. altered by constraints or guidelines that scientists offered? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's quite a super interesting question because it's not your go to the... Um, to the craft store and you buy this matter. Oh, I want this color and I'm right. going to make this beautiful piece. You know, it's not that easy. You got a lot of restriction in your process. Like you like the colors are kind of uh, dictated by what the insects needs or, um, or as well the materials, you know, you can't choose anything you want. You have to, and to, you have to be really in line with doing something which is like a uh, bio made and biodegradable uh, so it's it's a lot a lot of restriction and at the beginning you feel like i will never like manage to make something which is beautiful like in my a creative kind of style you know um but we always manage at the end of the day it's quite funny but the i think it's really the materials that guide us you know in the making process for example like we only recently started to make really big scale so in terms of uh, safety we need to make models for the work mm. like you know like small models um, but generally before that we were never never doing any models so it was really the materials that was guiding the process of making the pieces um, we were drawing like something very abstract like okay it's gonna be like this <laughs> and at the end of the day it was exactly like that abstract drawing <laughs> oh really so mostly so you yeah. could follow through at at what stage did you did you find that that's what can pan out ultimately was it very early on or was it after say a mock up it depends on the project but for please stand by it was the moment because you know the um, so it's made out of natural clay but it's not cooked right. so you need to find a way to waterproof the, um, the clay without mm -hmm. you know firing it so that was a huge challenge and I think it was, we had like two months to make like the full project. And it's after maybe one month of cooking because the, um, it's a bit of a laboratory of cooking, you know, the, the atelier. So it's after a month of experimenting with materials, how to waterproof a clay, mm -hmm. uh, like without firing it, you know, it was the question for one month. We were like trying everything with natural materials. Um, and it's after one month we succeeded of like finding a way uh, by implanting like natural wax inside the clay. Um, so it was like there is always this eureka moment where you're like, okay, yeah, okay, fine. So it's <laughs> not sometimes it's not yeah, sorry. coated with wax. It's embedded, like you mix the clay with wax. Embedded. So it's a, like you heat the wax, so it's it's liquid, and then you brush it into the clay, and it will um, stick. Like it will go inside the clay and create this protection inside the clay. So it's really waterproof. Like um, yeah. yeah. And is it is it beeswax wax or a different wax? No, it's a it's a um, it's a wax from cactus. Oh. It's called candelilla wax. Oh wow! Yeah. yeah. How, how long? And it's really. Dirty. How long do you expect some of these works, like as in, please stand by, for example, to last outdoors? Yeah. Outdoors, it depends if it's covered or not, because the only concern is when you have um like very very heavy rain. You know, it can just break, like it will break clay. Uh, but uh, in between two to five years outside. Is anyone okay? Two to five years. Does how yeah. do you how do you feel? Again, this is for the insects and not for the humans. Uh, how do you feel? No, it's a terrible insect. 
It's called please stand back. Right, right. Good point. <laughs> How do you feel about your work being ephemeral? Ah, uh, that's a good question. I'm um because I see it as in some I'm sense sure as almost... not ephemeral, but I I don't see a problem at all. I think it's the life of you know it's the process of the uh, of the pieces. But two to five years, if it's not protected in the wild, you know, like, uh, and it's not going to be completely, it's just going to be a bit damaged, but not, um, so it's quite long lasting for the outside. Um, but I, yeah, I don't mind. I think it's, um, I create this for a moment for the insect to live in. And uh, when it's time to go, it's time to go, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, in terms of who's inhabiting, does anyone take a census of the abundance or diversity within your pieces? I know you've mentioned, for example, that yes, there's some bees that are taking advantage and I'm assuming uh, solitary uh, bees, native bees, and you say the occasional spider, but do you have a sense of how many of these potential domiciles are being inhabited and by whom? At the, at the moment, you mean? Yeah. Um, we we, or, we don't create a lot. Let's there say there is not a lot. I... Sorry, I was thinking like at the uh, heat of the season when you expect the most to inhabit. Are is anyone yeah, yeah. censusing? Is anyone sorry? Is anyone taking a census to figure out who's in and how many? Uh, no, 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 not. I mean, most of them are inhabited by bees at the moment. So we know that the bees are in. And for the Mexico project, for example, they really hired a team to take care of the meliponas inside Mama, inside the sculpture. Um, and they are really happy actually inside the piece. So they made a lot of uh, babies. Um, so they really, because we never know, you know, we, we work with scientists, with laboratories, but we never know at the end of the day, the client is the insect. And we never know if it's going to work. But until now, every every piece has been in, inhabited, you know, by uh, by insects. And some of so them, it's quite. Yeah, some of them are with solitary bees and organisms and others yeah. with social, like, for example, with your yes. melipona, these are, yeah. these are truly social uh, stingless bee yeah. species. No. And you no, no. With it's honey. very different. Yeah, it's a very different process for solitary bees or for like more like fam like uh, human kind of oriented bees. Um, it's a very different type of typology of work, typology of entrance for them, typology of houses and materials, and everything is completely different. Can you give an example? One example of how you approach a project that involves say thousands in a social setting versus individuals scattered across a piece? Yes. Um, I would say that for uh, for like solitary uh, insect, it's mostly like a kind of a building. Uh, like if we talk about like human um, uh, as a human language. So it's very little, little entrance for every um, kind of insect to come in. And of course, for the um, for like a colony of of European bees, for example, is like a wall house, which is like that size, you know, like a beehive, but a very more organic and natural one, um, which is not made to produce honey. So it's a it's a different scale as well for the work, you know. It's um, so, for example, for Mama, there is seven colonies of meliponas inside the the piece, you know. Oh. So every branch. Like which distance you need to put the colonies from there from each other, like the entrance, how they are orientated for the sun. All this type of question is uh, very, very important. With the melopona, have you explored or been interested in exploring their very different nest architecture? So for example, they use a ceramine, which is a resin wax mix, which is different than what you find in honeybees, <laughs> but what you've worked with. That material looks, feels, smells very different. Do, do you imagine working yeah. that in different ways? Oh yeah, I would love to. 
<laughs> if someone invites me to do that, I would love to. Yeah, the architecture is amazing. Maybe yeah. we will share some uh, some videos of the architecture of them, but it's in, it's it's very different from the um, these we know. You know, that's a great it's idea. Very... I love the idea, and have and you must have seen say bumblebee nests with the honey pots, which is a very yeah, different yeah. organic feel than our prismatic yeah. hexagonal cells of honeybee combs. So yeah, but uh, regarding the architecture with Meliponas, for example, it makes me think of the place ten by kind of cocoons, you know, all accumulated like this. There is connection, like there is a language that is like going through the work. I think with a different species, it's it's quite interesting to see that. And that so this is also really unusual about your work. I haven't seen others who've combined in the way certainly in the way you have different species, in fact, different orders of insects, materials, their products together in what you've called somewhat of a leather. Could you describe yes. that process where you've got yeah. Bombyx, so, Mori, Silk, or That was kind of my first research with the materials of the, of the insect. And I was mostly interested of the two insects we farm most like as human, the silkworms and the honeybee. Um, and I, it came kind of naturally, this meeting between the two materials, but I work with the honeybee resin and the silkworms cocoon. Um, and so the silkworms cocoon, for those who don't know, is like a, composed by layers of fibers. And then you can extract all the fibers by hand. And the worm is creating a glucose serotonin that you can activate by spraying water into the fibers. So I made this kind of paper naturally without any binder or chemicals. And then the honeybee resin was actually, I think it was mostly like the materials that guided the process of making the leather because the honeybee resin was the perfect uh, match to combine with the uh, worm paper, you know, like yeah. the cocoon paper, because it gives a lot of strength to the first material. And it's, yeah, it's like you can warm it up and it will reactivate the, the resin. So you can stretch it, you can mold it. So I think it was a beautiful way to, um, to uh, yeah, to do this harmony of the two insects together. I've never been able to hold or uh, see your pieces in person. And I really want to. Um, I saw uh, examples. I can send you a Oh my gosh, that'd be amazing. So I've yeah. seen videos, for example, of, of gallery attendees smelling your pieces, right? Yeah. And Let's... or even touching the hexagonal leather-like pieces, right, of this yeah. work that you produced. Uh, can you describe uh, what it's like? Because so when I work with honeybees, of course, as you as you mentioned, you can scrape off the propolis that resin mix yeah. that they gather and then uh, create with a mix from their own bodies. And it's really, really sticky. And, and the idea is honeybees need to fill these gaps that might cause too much ventilation in their, if they're cavity nesting insects. And so they fill the gaps, but as, as a beekeeper, beekeepers face this gummy, sticky exit or this, um, product that very is then sticky. ultimately scraped out so that you can lift out frames if you're dealing with say a typical Langstroth hive. Now oftentimes that's just boop, discarded. So from that sticky matter, can you talk about the smell, the touch, the taste, the feel of this product mm -hmm. from beginning to end? So uh so I think it's a love story because I'm always smelling this because I have it in my hands at the moment. <laughs> it's a very sticky material. So when, when we collect it, it's a mix of a lot of uh, pollen and waxes and, and resin as well. So you, we spend a lot of time cleaning the resin. Um, so we boil everything in hot water to be able to separate all the different um, materials. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we 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 yeah we we worked a lot with the hands so we have these very sticky materials but combined to the um, to the cocoons for example it's not sticky at all anymore you know 
as soon as it's very very clean um and the smell is it's really part of a of a, of a process so when people visit the exhibition they don't know the material so much or mm. maybe the smell is a little idea but a lot of people think it's glass or ceramic or things like that so it's very interesting actually to not to give too much uh, clues you know to people so it brings uh, a lot of uh, not maybe not excitement but like oh but what is it you know like curiosity um so it's it's quite interesting to guide the audience but not too much on what it is and then the um, yeah the smell is part of it forever you know like i will send you a sample and like some of them are like 10 years old and they smell like like oh, very small, you know um and then the i think what brings a lot more identity to a work as well is those shapes and the material combination um, because the shape seems very alive. Sometimes the museum uh, curator are saying like we have to, we have the impression that the piece will it's gonna leave the museum, <laughs> but it's a like, little animal, you know. But this <laughs> we we do. It's a very intuitive uh, kind of process. So all of this, like the smell, the the, the yeah, it's, you want to touch it. It seems very alive. After the processing. And say, for example, if yeah. it's uh, from insects or of insects and men, in yeah. those pieces, uh, are they really as smooth and hard as glass at that point? Or can you leave thumb impressions? Can you leave what? A finger can impression? Can you leave impressions? Like if you stick your nail in, would it leave? Ah, no, no. It's very, it's very, once like the process of cleaning is done, it's very strong. But it's very, very brittle. It's very brittle. Oh, as glass. Is. It's very brittle. Like if you, um, yeah, if you throw it on the floor, it's going to break, like in, in tons of pieces. And I'm sure you've, uh, you're have you speaking from experience. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> in some pieces... But you can repair it. You can repair it forever. That's the beauty of it, you know? Not as glass. It's not like... You know, like if you break the vase, for example, you can re repair it and fix it because we can remelt the material as much as you want. Do you reheat it? Yes, you can reheat it as much as you want. And in some pieces, you combine discarded black glass with the yeah. black propolis. Is that to contribute yeah. it? Is that to contribute to the wonder of what the materials are? Because you've got this exquisite exactly. sheen and uh, reflection. Uh, yeah, of parts of I think uh, the collection of insect and men came like um, because people in exhibition really like sometimes were passing by the pieces like uh, and thinking that it was glass. So it was a way to kind of uh, not manipulate but like uh, wander, you know, around this kind of um, uh, strange materials that seems completely artificial and uh, and that is not at, at the end of the day. Let's talk about functionality and mm -hmm. okay. in, industrial I'm level. Very... <laughs> That's right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna push you to think about the role yeah. of functionality in design pieces and the aspiration for industrial grade or industrial level design or production, because you've spoken in the past about how, uh, well, I'll let you talk about functionality, but the goal here isn't to, to, to find, to discover and to promote the latest industrial material to be used on huge scales, correct? Yeah. Um, so I think in terms of functionality um what i do mostly now is really functional for insects and not human that's for sure uh what i've done in the past i don't call them objects i mean i sometimes i define them as cabinets because um it was a way to speak to humans about insects so i was referencing of work of objects they know you know like vases or or cabinets or shelves, you know, like things that human knew, but in a very kind of provocative way, like, okay, this is not 
like uh, something it's more an artifact it's it's a piece that needs to exist to tell a message and to give a value and authenticity and a voice to insects it's not for you to put to place your i don't know your watches or, or whatever or your clothes it's it's mostly to um once again to provoke you to rethink your perception of what is a material and how things uh, have to be made you know so that was like the first artifacts that were made but mostly now my client as i said is the is the insects um so mostly i do habitats for men i still continue to develop like the materials and the work that are more like human kind of orientated but in a kind of a provocation you know so i like to provoke the nice way so tell me about the difference in terms of gratification that you experience working for humans versus working for insects uh, but I, I think for me it was um it was a big relief because when i did this like when i i was working more on the human orientated with with the help of the waste of the insects um it was nice but it was not enough and when i took the, the path of like okay i want actually to really uh, dialogue with insects and propose them habitats and to um, open door for them in cities to increase biodiversity like to really give them more spaces and step back as human you know it was super rewarding i i was i felt very aligned in my practice uh, I feel like okay, this is not greenwashing because now it's very trendy. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm very aligned. What I do is very working and it just makes sense. And it's so good when you're an artist or a designer to feel that because we live in a world where there is so many chairs, so many fairs, so many things for people to buy new things or like, and, and it was, uh, and it's always a question when you make, you know, like, why do I make? Because we don't need what, what I make, actually. Nobody needs what I make. Like, okay, this piece is going to be made just to exist. So that's the point or not. And this is always <laughs> like, well, what, what needs, do we need another chair? That was what my, yes, we need a chair for insects. That was my answer, you know. <laughs> so I think it was a big relief because I felt that, my value and my authenticity were very aligned and it was making sense. It's just uh, like what makes sense to do, like, you know, with this crazy world we live in, what makes sense to exist? And that was the best answer for me. And I think I can continue now forever because I have a lot of work <laughs> to do. <laughs> yeah. And when I think about these these pieces being inhabited by insects, I kind of imagine you as an as an insect architect or as an architect on insect scales yeah. and yeah. insect scales that's a funny thing to think about because you've got everything from trichoptera caddisflies that are producing their own individual sleeves or uh, cases with their cephalic silk glands all the way to giraffe tall termite mounds or leaf cutter ants nests that extend greatly underground so of course, the scale goes across magnitudes, yes. but but you're looking at, in a sense, for the solitary insects, apartment buildings, even for the social insects in the case of mama, kind of an apartment yeah. building in a sense, because you have seven colonies of melopona stingless bees. So I want I wanted Mama to be like very massive. Like uh, I wanted like and 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 I hope you can visit it like uh, one day if you pass by Mexico. Um, but I wanted something very massive. And and as soon as I arrived in front of Mama as a human, I felt so impressed. It was like oh, oh. <laughs> you know, I wanted to give like a weight uh, for the meliponas. And and what I felt when I first saw the um, the piece, like like the scale of it, was yeah. very impressive. So it's what I'm really trying to to do now. I I'm developing. I mean, this is a, a first idea, but it's something I have in mind for a very long time. Um, I have a land in the in the Alps where I'm from, and I want to build like monuments for insects. You know, like uh, <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> Yeah, I know you love it. <laughs> wow, that's like that's an entomologist's dream. Yeah, so it's the start of a project. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think like I really want to go big 
for them. And at the same time, I'm developing as well little villages that are more like um, at the insect scale, you know, like small pieces that are all together to create villages that you can place them on facade of buildings or like in gardens and things like that. So beyond, uh, say, creating a green roof, for example, mm -hmm. You could have whole buildings that are designed in certain ways to accommodate a range of species. And we've got so much, in a sense, wasted surface area that's mm -hmm. anthropogenic, that humans produce, um, that's asphalt, that's steel. And wouldn't it be more interesting to consider uh, outside of Homo sapiens, the range of organisms that could take advantage of without yeah. uh, destroying without um without disturbing beyond the uh sad conventional Human. sense yeah right. that's right yeah without yeah because well, i mean i don't want to evict as well human you know in my practice that's not the case i just want to give a voice to many 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 worlds um but um, and I think it's when you were talking about the industry um, before, it's where the industry is coming in now. Like at this scale, you know how to integrate insects in our daily life in cities. It's mostly like we have a discussion with the industry and it's something that I've been afraid of for the past 12 years since I started. But I start to be more kind of open and I think there is discussion now that can start to be created. Um, so I think the industry needs to be tackled a little bit way on that. Fascinating. Well, I can't do it only by myself. Huh? <laughs> well, I hope that I hope that grows into something uh, collaboratively massive, and as you say, yeah. not a a greenwashing effort, but something that's truly environmentally, ecologically meaningful. Because yeah, exactly. If, if Homo sapiens is going to take up as much space as we do, I hope we accommodate more. Of course, yeah. And we have so much spaces, you know, to give back. Right. Very soon, your work is going to be part of a very different exhibit than I imagine normally you uh, participate yeah. in. So, so your work has appeared the world over. And I'm thinking about art spaces, art museums, Pompidou, uh, uh, Al Albert and Victoria, or Victoria and Albert Museum in Australia. And very sh soon you'll be in New York City for the Imaginary Insects exhibit. Yeah. And that's a, that's a thematic, not uh, exclusively art venture. So how has yeah. that been? Or is it too early to ask this? How has that been? <laughs> Um, so I, I think the, the show in New York will be super interesting because it's, it's merging what I was talking to you about, like, okay, working in public space, in museums, but accessible, uh, to a lot of people. And what I like about this exhibition in New York is that it will be, you know, not especially art orientated, but like with so many inputs from different people. So that makes it like very um, open and unst understandable as well. And very, I think, in a way, um, what is not really my thing because I'm I'm not into that, but I think it's really what works. And I talked uh, with a curator about it, um, about Instagramming and, uh, you know, like very, um, 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 eyes catching, you know, and and I think it's um, for most of the people that are that live in this uh, planet, uh, this is um, a very good way to show them that there is other like species around them, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm very curious to see how people will react on that. Uh, because I know that the show will address a lot of uh, sustainable and ecological uh, points during the, um, the show. Um, so I think it will be really super well received. Um, and, yeah. that could, and that could potentially travel, which is uh, exciting because yeah. it would travel from, um, ideally, from that metropolis to other uh, huge cities. Yeah, exactly. That and I think it's one of the first show, no, that, that is doing that. Maybe uh, you know more about. 
it's one of the first show in the world now that is only focusing on insects. Yeah, there. Or maybe I'm wrong. Well, there. It. Yeah, that's an interesting question because you have, for example, the I know. Montreal's Insectarium, which is the permanent established entity, and yeah. some have gone under, but there are uh, there are dedicated facilities with insects. And there are portions of, like, for example, the new Insect Hall at the American Museum of Natural History, which I hope you're able to visit. Um, I'm, I'm... But in terms of, in this case, a year-long exhibit focused on insects, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm used to gallery exhibits or museum exhibits that are uh, short in duration. But yeah. can I ask you about some of your thoughts yes. dealing with ethics and the ethics of sericulture, working with silk. So when you've produced your works, you've made a point that you work with discarded cocoons. So, yeah. and, and when we think about this, we think about the millennia old sericulture practice, which involves heat treating or killing the pupae within these cocoons so that when they close, emerge as adults, they don't bite their way out and break that very long strand of silk that they've spun so that we can unwind into skeins. But yeah. you, al you allow them to close as the bomb. Yeah, yeah. So I, only, yeah I, only, I, I only work with, uh, with cocoons that are from the piece silk that really allows the, the worm to morph as a butterfly. And that's a very... Uh, I mean, crucial point in my practice, you know, because everything I do is in respect of uh, of the insect. So it's it's yeah, it's still a way to really like celebrate the life. I mean, a lot of pieces uh, were created, like Frozen and Cocoon Collection, was mm -hmm. really created to celebrate the life of the insect and to go like bigger in scale with the addition of a cocoon um, to give them a voice. So yeah, it's a very important uh, point. How do you grapple with or what do you make of this real idea that those domesticated silkworm moths, Bombix mori, are wholly dependent on humans? So if you wanted to liberate them, they would not be able to fly and they wouldn't be able to reproduce, right? So we're, they are tied to us uh, in perpetuity. And how does that does that factor at all into your uh, thinking or production of works with uh, Bombix Mori Silk? Mm, I, I think it's, uh, I mean, it really depends how you actually work with insect. I think it's a bit similar as, as beekeeping and it's, I think it's like beekeeping can be really good and really bad, you know? So I, I think it's, it depends of, uh, of the dialogue and the way you treat uh, the insects when you, work with them and you collaborate with them and what you take from them. So is it okay to take this or to take that, you know? So I think it's a lot about your authenticity and your values when you work with um, with different species. Um, but it's the same way with beekeeping, for example, like when you, when you make honey, like you make tons of honey and you travel with the bees everywhere and you change their, you know, behavior and like, uh, everything by doing that and when you have just a beekeeper who is taking maybe 10 kilograms a hive a year you know like and the hive is full of honey but he let the honey to the bees you know it's a it's a question of respect and authenticity so there is a lot of different way of working with insects and farming insects um and then at the end of the day if like if you can sleep in your beds with like a clear mind and being aligned with your authenticity it's uh it's what i i wish everybody is doing you know really well put because as you say with beekeeping um at what point is it collaboration what point is it exploitation and with the silkworm moths and the bees in a sense it's a success story with an asterisk for them of a human Actually, for the insects in a way, because we've spread Apis mellifera honeybees across the world through the Western Hemisphere, for example, and silkworm moths the same. This one species is far greater in abundance 
than they otherwise would be if we hadn't yeah. domesticated them yet in many ways they're tied so it's it, a fascinating relationship yeah and it's i i think it's yeah it's a lot about values mm -hmm. and and authenticity you know and and i think with the time everything is changing as well you know like for example my dad started like 45 years ago beekeeping the relation to like production everything was completely different you know and when we with the time it changed a lot his way of like working with bees and and collecting the honey you know everything is involving with the time we live in so it's a lot of adaptation as well with your values all the time you need to it's like raising a kid you know you always have to balance like <laughs> what you do what, it, what is good or not you know um because with time everything is changing so fast and at the moment everything is changing super fast and ask human to really reconsider the, the like the living organism we have around us um and it's a bit of a um, uh, of an emergency you know mm -hmm to do that. And I wanted to ask you a couple more questions. One, first, I'd love to uh, virtually walk through your studio with you. What is that like? Uh, how do you set it up? What do, what inspires you in terms of, um, like for some, it might be an idea board with images. For others, it's a clean space. For others, it's- yeah. Alors, I have to say that today I'm at the office at home, so I won't be able to give you a tour. <laughs> I, I will... I'm imagining an imaginary tour. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to do an imaginary tour? And um, no, the studio is, um, so I'm based in Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, and soon um, I will be, I will have like this land in, uh, in the Alps as well, where I will develop a uh, little big things um but my studio is in uh, the suburb of paris so there is a garden and uh, it's near like one of the biggest parks of paris so it's very calm and quiet it fits like the countryside it's very nice um and it's very dirty it's <laughs> so there is um, a <laughs> very there is three rooms. So the one at the back is like for the very dirty, dirty work, like like the dust and everything, like the woodwork and things like that. The one in the middle is the laboratory where we try a lot of things with the materials, uh, where we make the piece. And the last room is quite clean, but like clean as a workshop, you know, yeah. but it's like where we take the pictures, we pack, we have the office, we do the meetings and, and everything. So it's quite nice to have separated, you know, the dirt because it can be very dirty and it's very smelly as well. Um, <laughs> because last week we worked with a uh, honeybee resin and um, and the neighbors said that it was smelling until like 500 meters away. <laughs> I hope they weren't so complaining. I hope they were enjoying the smells. <laughs> no, no, they are not. And it's a new space, but we, you know, we worked a lot with uh, Deng Fu as well. Uh, in the past, uh, so we haven't worked with Deng Fu yet, and I think it's going to be complicated with the neighbors. Uh, but ah! we will see. <laughs> so that it's a... yeah, sorry. Uh, so that that's a great segue. I wanted to ask you, maybe as a a wrap up ex exploratory question, what lies in the future? So I you you mentioned that, but I was thinking dung balls, discarded paper wasp nests, say the mud dauber, uh, mud or clay nests, or lac or cochineal, or silk from 180,000 other species of Lepidoptera or other orders of insects. So obviously insects produce such an array of products with untapped potential in terms of the properties as well as the aesthetics do you yeah. imagine further exploring a diversity of materials through a diversity of arthropods yeah yeah definitely so i from now i i really investigated like the pollinators and the mostly the bees and the silkworms and you know, in ten years, I didn't do the round of it. Huh? It's uh, it takes so much time um, to really investigate and make things that make sense. Um, but I really want to go yeah into new species now. 
uh, as well. And that's why I'm connecting it to the project on the land, you know, of this monument for the different species. Um, so yeah, it's it's a lot of things that, that are buzzing. <laughs> and as you say, continue with producing for the insects. Of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is, and, and now a lot of people are asking for it, a lot. Oh, it, a lot. So for you, what does that mean in terms of uh, collaborations or where you have clients? If you're doing freelance mm -hmm. as a designer, uh, how much freedom do you have in terms of the products you create in, and what oh, the yeah, desires of those clients are? I think I have all the freedom. If I don't have the freedom, I won't do it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, 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 like, no, 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 nobody never talked to me now. It's not, I, I, I have my own, you know, kind of practice. I will never, I say prostitute. Like, no, no, I don't say prostitute, but I don't know to say in English. Like, mm -hmm. I will never send my soul to the devil. <laughs> I, yeah, because as I said, my values are very important. And if I feel that something is wrong, uh, I will just go, you know, and, and not do the project. Um, because at the end of the day, it's not for me, it's for the insects, but we live in those species that are, you know, in museum or institution or, or whatever. So it's important to be very clear and transparent and everything. Well, I thank you so much. I see your work as not only inherently exquisite, but really in the most profound ways, creative in terms of exploring the products and, and the lives of the diversity of arthropods around us. So thank you so much and continue doing so amazing perfect. work. And I, I love to explore it in person. And to go to the Alps among the city of insects that you build. No, but I will let you know like this.